Welcome to the Books Radar channel, where we summarize the essence content of best-selling books, helping you quickly grasp the book's core insight and save valuable time. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a book called Rapport. Its subtitle is The Four Ways to Read People. This book focuses on how to establish a strong rapport with others through effective communication. The authors of this book are a unique couple, Lawrence Allison and Emily Allison. Both of them are experts in interrogation psychology, specializing in getting suspects to talk during various interrogations. They have over 30 years of experience in this field and truly live up to the book's title, Mastering the Art of Communication, Building Powerful Relationships with Strategic Communication. You know, communication between interrogators and suspects is considered one of the most challenging forms of communication in the world. However, the author's research reveals that even in such difficult communication scenarios, certain communication techniques can have a significant impact. Drawing from their practical experience, they've developed a comprehensive communication guide, which has been adopted by international law enforcement agencies and police organizations in multiple countries. The book we're discussing today is essentially the layman's version of this communication guide. In our everyday lives, we often encounter challenging communication situations. For example, how do you address a colleague who has crossed your boundaries? How do you connect with your teenager who locks themselves in their room and refuses to talk? How do you communicate when faced with poor customer service? These are just a few examples. The authors tell us that, in handling these difficult communication scenarios, we shouldn't rely on ad hoc responses. Instead, we should master a systematic communication methodology to establish strong relationships with others in interpersonal interactions. This is the key to addressing problems at their root. A strong relationship refers to a state of mutual recognition and understanding between people. When two people are in such a relationship, communication and cooperation become much smoother. Whether you want to expand your network of personal relationships, turn adversaries into allies, or extract reliable information from initially uncooperative sources, mastering the art of building strong relationships is crucial. It's not just a fundamental life skill, but also a vital professional skill. Next, I'll break down the process of building strong relationships with others into two parts. The first part consists of universal relationship building principles, and the second part includes four communication models named after animals, each suited for different types of individuals. You can choose the model that best fits your needs to enhance your ability to connect with others. Part 1. Let's start with the first part, where I'll introduce you to the universal relationship building principles, which the authors have coined as the HERE principles. HERE stands for Honesty, Empathy, Autonomy, and Reflection. Honesty means that in conflict situations, we should not evade issues, sugarcoat problems, or beat around the bush. We should express our thoughts candidly to others. The authors emphasize that honesty forms the foundation for any strong relationship. Furthermore, when conveying our thoughts, it's often better to communicate face-to-face -face rather than using passive means like emails, texts, or instant messaging. These passive methods can lead to loss of information and emotions, resulting in misunderstandings. Now, let's discuss autonomy. Autonomy means that during communication, we shouldn't micromanage others. We should give them sufficient space to make their own decisions and encourage them to decide independently. Psychologists have found that the more pressure we exert on someone to make them comply with our wishes, the more likely they are to resist or rebel. So, even if you strongly desire others to follow your instructions, it's essential to grant them the freedom to choose. Even when giving advice, it's crucial to include statements like, of course, the decision is entirely yours, or provide several options. 
So far, we've covered honesty and autonomy, and I believe these concepts are clear. Now, let's delve into empathy and reflection. Empathy is a term you might often hear when discussing communication topics. It involves understanding the emotions and values of others through perspective taking. While some people may naturally excel at empathy, others may require external techniques to become proficient at it. For instance, when someone shares their situation with us, it's helpful to confirm their feelings. If a friend tells you, I'm not sure if my marriage will last, how should you respond? Should you say, don't think too much, just live your life, or if it doesn't work, get a divorce? Empathy requires us not to judge others' perspectives, but instead respond to their emotions. You could say, what's been happening? You must be feeling quite distressed, right? In this way, your friend might acknowledge your statement, admitting that they indeed feel distressed. Alternatively, they might say they haven't reached that level of distress, but simply find themselves increasingly reluctant to stay at home. Regardless of their response, you gain a better understanding of their thoughts. This is the primary purpose of empathy, it encourages others to provide more information, deepening the conversation. However, what about those he wants to go east, and I want to go west conflict scenarios? How can empathy be employed effectively? Consider this simple example from the book. Suppose your three-year-old child insists on wearing a green dinosaur t-shirt to daycare, but it's freshly washed and not dry yet. If you respond by simply saying, it's wet, you can't wear it, the child might burst into tears and refuse to listen. Instead, you could use a combination of empathy and autonomy. You might say, sweetie, I understand that you love that t-shirt, and it would make you unhappy not to wear it, right? But, this shirt isn't dry yet. I promise to dry it today, so you can wear it tomorrow. Today, you can choose from another 20 dinosaur t-shirts. That way, we won't be late. How does that sound? In this dialogue, you first acknowledge the child's feelings, before addressing the issue. This allows the child to lower their resistance and better receive your message. The authors found that when you want someone to change their mind, this approach is often one of the best choices. However, there may be times when you find it challenging to empathize with someone. In such cases, you can't naturally understand their thoughts or feelings. This often happens when dealing with teenagers, for example. Let's say you've noticed your 13-year-old son suddenly becoming moody, reticent, and spending all his time in his room with his phone. You're concerned and want to talk to him. Some parents might call their child out and directly ask, what's wrong? Are you having issues with your friends? The child may respond with, no. Is someone bullying you at school? No. Did the teacher scold you? No. So, is it because of your recent test scores? At this point, the child might become impatient. They may stand up and tell you to stop being nosy and that there's nothing wrong. This kind of approach is common but often ineffective. Instead, the authors recommend using the empathy plus autonomy method. For example, you could say, I've noticed you've been feeling down lately and you're not talking much. You seem to be isolating yourself. If you ever want to talk, you can come to me anytime. I promise I won't yell at you or get angry. But if you'd rather not talk about it now, that's also fine. It's your choice. This statement respects the child's autonomy and offers empathy, creating a safe and welcoming space for them to open up when they're ready. It acknowledges their feelings without prying or pressuring them. Now, moving on to reflection, the last component of the HERE principles. Reflection means that, after completing a conversation, it's essential to review and reflect on what was discussed. 
Think about whether the conversation went well and whether you achieved your communication goals. Reflection can help you identify areas for improvement and make necessary adjustments in future conversations. It's like a debriefing process, allowing you to fine-tune your communication skills continuously. Continuing with the conversation between the couple, after the boyfriend's suggestion to start by giving up late-night snacks, the girlfriend responded unhappily, saying, Yes, we can start with small things. Do you have any suggestions? When the boyfriend suggested giving up late-night snacks, the girlfriend became upset and said, I work late every day, and I get really hungry at night. So, do you think I'm getting fat? I noticed you've been chatting quite a bit with Amy lately. She does have a nice figure. Do you like someone with her body? The author advises that when faced with such questions, you should never answer directly with a yes or no, nor should you engage in an argument. Instead, you should think, does she really want to hear you admit whether you like her friend or not? What is she truly trying to express? And what does she care about? For the boyfriend, an appropriate response would be, Listen, I know you're feeling a bit down right now and not very satisfied with yourself. But I have to tell you, my feelings for you haven't changed at all. Even if you were to gain weight in the future, I'd still only have feelings for you. This way, he addresses the girlfriend's true concerns rather than just what she said. The author notes that interpretive summarization is the most challenging among all feedback techniques. It requires a lot of practice. During practice, you can use phrases like it seems like you feel, or it looks like you care a lot about, to make the other person feel that you care about and understand them. Having discussed the universally applicable here principles, honesty, empathy, autonomy, and reflection, it's time to delve into the second part of the book, which focuses on developing a personalized communication model for building rapport. The authors, drawing from their extensive experience in observing human interactions, have identified four primary communication models that individuals often fall into. These models are metaphorically named after animals, the Tyrannosaurus rex, the lion, the monkey, and the mouse. Each communication model possesses both positive and negative traits. To maximize effective communication, it's crucial to amplify the positive aspects while mitigating the negative ones. Now, let's explore each of these four communication models in detail. You can assess which one aligns with your characteristics based on their positive traits and then work on avoiding the negative ones. We'll begin with the Tyrannosaurus Rex communication model. The positive traits of a Tyrannosaurus Rex include being candid and direct. They are unambiguous about their boundaries and communicate their thoughts clearly. This approach ensures that others understand their perspective and don't dismiss their concerns. However, some Tyrannosaurus Rex communicators may become excessively aggressive or lose their temper during interactions. They might resort to sarcasm, reproach, or intimidation. Such behavior can be counterproductive and hinder problem solving. For example, the book's co-author, Emily, exhibited negative Tyrannosaurus Rex traits when faced with a noisy construction site during a family vacation. She angrily called the front desk to complain, demanding an immediate resolution. The front desk promised to have the manager call back but failed to do so. In contrast, Emily's husband and co-author, Lawrence, took a different approach. He recorded the construction noise with a tablet, politely approached the front desk, and mentioned their welcoming letter, which assured a minimal impact from maintenance. Lawrence played the recorded noise, asking if it aligned with a minimal impact. The staff conceded that it did not, leading to a more productive discussion. Ultimately, they relocated to another resort with a 50% discount and bonus points. 
Lawrence's calm and objective approach proved more effective than Emily's anger and aggression. The authors emphasized that emotional, aggressive expressions not only hinder problem resolution but also damage relationships, isolating individuals. To embody the positive Tyrannosaurus Rex traits, aim for clear and composed expression of your thoughts, refraining from insulting or aggressive language, regardless of the other party's behavior. Remember, the goal is to make your voice heard, communicate your boundaries, and not engage in a power struggle or vent emotions. If possible, rehearse your statements with a trusted person to defuse emotions, helping you maintain composure in subsequent interactions. Moving on to the lion communication model, which differs from the Tyrannosaurus Rex. While Tyrannosaurus Rexes clarify boundaries, lions excel in providing explicit instructions and guidance. They possess strong leadership qualities, making this communication style suitable for managers and parents. However, some lions may impose their will on others or excessively micromanage. This negative aspect can lead to resistance and stifle independent thinking. Ideal lion communication involves clear directives without being domineering. Encourage autonomy in minor decisions and invest time in understanding others' perspectives. Use encouragement rather than commands. Leaders need not oversee every detail but can delegate and nurture team members consciously. Additionally, the book introduces the monkey communication model, which can also be valuable for managers and parents. Monkeys exhibit positive traits like friendliness, warmth, and cooperation, fostering excellent collaborative relationships and team cohesion. However, friendly, warm, and cooperative monkeys also have their shortcomings, namely, they tend to blur the boundaries with others. Whether it's parents with children, bosses with subordinates, or colleagues, once the boundaries are lost, and everyone becomes too accommodating, it becomes difficult to address the issues, and management or cooperation becomes challenging. So, while fostering friendly cooperation, it's also essential to maintain clear boundaries. For example, with colleagues, avoid discussing too many personal matters, with children, don't cater to their every whim, establish clear rules, and set boundaries. If you find yourself trapped in a situation with blurred boundaries and find it challenging to address issues with others, it's time to incorporate a bit of the Tyrannosaurus Rex style communication. For instance, if it's a subordinate or colleague, you can say that you value your friendship and appreciate the openness you share, but you must point out the existing problems and then express your thoughts. The author suggests that although the situation might become a bit awkward, it's better than letting the boundaries blur, and the problems remain unresolved. Rest assured, real friends will understand your position, respect you, and not take advantage of your emotional connection for their convenience. If not, it might be time to re-evaluate your relationship. Next, let's discuss the last communication style, the mouse. Its essence lies in letting the other party take control while being willing to follow and make concessions. The author believes that the mouse is one of the most crucial communication styles for building rapport. This might sound surprising, but it's a conclusion drawn from thousands of hours of studying interrogation recordings. They found that the best interrogators demonstrated respect and humility towards their subjects, regardless of how much they disliked them or wanted to bring them to justice. For instance, they once observed a weaker overpowering the stronger interrogation, which vividly demonstrated the mouse's advantages. In this interrogation, there was a petite interrogator facing a burly suspect with a history of violence. The suspect had always been tight-lipped and enjoyed interrupting interrogators with a disrespectful attitude. This time, he faced a new interrogator with a smug remark, I know you've got a list of questions in your notepad, and your job is to ask them. I know you're going to try and trap me, we have nothing to talk about. 
Unexpectedly, the interrogator remained calm, laid out his notebook in front of the suspect, which was entirely blank. He said, I don't have a list. I just want to hear you talk about what you're planning. The suspect smirked and replied, all right, then. But first, answer me this, why should I cooperate with you? The interrogator remained silent for 10 seconds and then calmly said, the day the police arrested you, I suspected you were planning to murder a police academy student. I don't know the specifics or why you had to do it, only you know that. I want to know the answers, not to please my superiors, but to protect the people. I won't force you to tell me, the choice is yours. After a brief pause, the suspect said, since that's how it is, I'll tell you. But it's only to help you understand what's happening in this country. Why could the interrogator successfully engage the suspect in conversation? The author believes it's because he didn't seek to control the suspect. It was clear that the suspect wanted to lead the conversation, to be the lion. The interrogator complied. He remained calm, patient, and humble, just like a mouse waiting for the lion to enter the cage. We'll find that to be a positive mouse, the key is to utilize the communication weapon mentioned in the first part, autonomy. Autonomy doesn't equate to weakness, it's a subtle yet powerful technique. It allows the other party to feel in control, which can lead them to let down their guard, offer information voluntarily, or make concessions. However, mice also have some negative traits, such as hesitancy, weakness, and reticence. If a manager exhibits these characteristics, it becomes challenging to maintain order within a team or project. So, the author suggests that while you can let others take the lead in communication, you shouldn't appear weak. Use feedback strategies effectively during listening to steer the conversation. When you need to demonstrate your leadership, decisiveness, and confidence, you can abandon the mouse mode and instead take on a positive lion or monkey role. All right, at this point, we've covered the four communication styles categorized by animals. You may now have a clearer understanding of which animal type you most frequently embody and the areas for improvement and enhancement. The author emphasizes that, in terms of positive traits, there's no single style that's the most positive. In reality, each communication style has its place, and the key is your ability to adopt the appropriate style for different situations. Above all, these are the key points I wanted to share with you from this book. It primarily consists of two parts, the HEAR principles, which are honesty, empathy, autonomy, and feedback, these are universal tools for building rapport. The second part introduces the four communication styles named after different animals. You can see that each style has both positive and negative traits. To achieve the best communication results, we need to amplify the positive traits and avoid the negative ones. If you find yourself intrigued by this book, we recommend obtaining a copy for further reading. If you found this video helpful, please consider liking and subscribing to my channel. Your support keeps me motivated to create more valuable content. Thanks for listening, see you in the next video.